Sometimes dry, sometimes satirical, and always quirky, these Britcoms are our cup of tea. Dear sexy knickers, <laughs> I don't half fancy you. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 British TV comedies. It's going to be hilarious. <laughs> Sometimes I could kiss your mind, Roy. <laughs> Number 10, The IT Crowd. Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> Created and written by Irish writer Graham Linehan, who had previously co-created Father Ted and Black Books, the IT crowd proved there was still life in the traditional multicam sitcom format. This, Jen, is the internet. <laughs> Rife with pop cultural references and news items, the show follows two endlessly goofy yet strangely believable nerds in their attempts to interact with, help, and avoid the rest of the world. It's almost as if she doesn't know anything about computers. What? <laughs> what you did? Oh, don't worry, that's why I always make two cups of tea. Number nine, Father Ted. Have you been reading those Roddy Doyle books again, Dugan? <laughs> I have, yeah, Ted, you big gobshite. Set on a fictional Irish island, this series is packed to the gills with lovable cartoony oddballs. Who could never make it on the mainland? I'm fine for cake, Mrs. Doyle. Are you sure, Father? <laughs> There's cocaine in it. This includes the titular Ted, his dim-witted sidekick Father Dougal McGuire, and the perpetually drunken Father Jack. Given to moments of outright surrealism and pure silliness, the show initially set out to be a parody of sitcoms, but eventually it became the gold standard of the form. <laughs> Number 8, Mr. Bean. As much a sketch show as it is a sitcom, this is arguably Rowan Atkinson's best-known work. Internationally popular due to its limited dialogue, Mr. Bean copes with minor setbacks in everyday life through unnecessarily difficult and sometimes plain mean-spirited methods. <laughs> Although the later animated series implied that Bean is an alien, we prefer to see him as just a weird, weird, weird little man. Number seven, Red Dwarf. Rimmer! He's dead, Dave. Everybody is dead. Everybody is dead, Dave. <laughs> Wait, are you trying to tell me everybody's dead? Part odd couple, part lost in space, this series takes place three million years in the future following an accident that killed a mining ship's crew, and it traces the last living human's trip back to Earth. This slob's accompanied on his quest by a hologram of a long-dead annoying co-worker, the humanoid descendant of his cat, a senile computer, and an emotional mechanoid. Name? I'll just put Crichton. Being a dwarfer means experiencing zany sci-fi situations and laughs from even the simplest of exchanges. Chicken soup. Yep, that's working. Number six, are you being served? What sort of person's gonna buy him? Well, possibly someone who's going to a dance tonight at the social club and wishes to create a stir. <laughs> you don't mean. This long-lasting BBC favorite plowed through 10 series and delivered a solid 69 episodes. Wink, wink. Yeah, I did ballet once. It's like keep fit to music, and you have to put your leg up on the bar. Oh, well, Mrs. Slocum's already trained for that at the local. <laughs> Often banking on innuendo and double entendres, and frequently breaking the fourth wall, served was anything but highbrow. Set in a la di da department store, the series, like Python before it, mined the rich British class system, from the lowly Cockney to the supposed Gentile officer classes. Uh, shall I tell them of the latest developments? Oh, yes, you'd better. I'll make a mess of it. Ooh, I wish it'd get on. My leg's gone to sleep. <laughs> Number five, only fools and horses. I thought the bloke you bought it from said an idiot could work it. <laughs> yes, Ye yes, that's right, yes. Rodney! <laughs> Who doesn't love a good get-rich-quick scheme? Running a shady enterprise out of their van, Del Boy and Rodney try anything to make a few quid, 
from selling glowing paint to sex dolls filled with explosive gas. <laughs> and all of this, of course, happens well under the table. Failed plans of the week aside, much of the series' humor comes from Del Boy's various faux pas and a pinch of slapstick. <laughs> Number four, The Office. Oh, here's Elaine. She left it yet? Yeah. All right, see you then. She has left him. I forgot about that. There are game changers and there are game changers. And this, friends, is the latter the staff, letting them know that they are our most important commodity. And if they've got a problem, it's my problem. Uh... Adopting a mockumentary-style approach, Ricky Gervais and crew ushered out the laugh track and ushered in a new era of sitcom making, influencing American shows like Modern Family and Parks and Recreation. A critical hit in its own right, the Office UK also spawned international remakes, including but not limited to the Steve Carell-led US version. Put my stapler inside the jelly again. That's the third time he's done it. It wasn't even funny the first time. Why has he done that? Just told him once that I don't like jelly. I don't trust the way it moves. Number three, Blackadder. Oh, very good shot, my lord. Thank you, Warren. <laughs> Originally expensive and not hugely funny, this Rowan Atkinson period comedy wasn't exactly a hit out of the gate. All that changed with the second series, Blackadder 2, which included a shift in characterization, a switch in time period, and a switch in writers in the form of Ben Elton. Come on, Edmund, you must be able to think of another best man. Well, I suppose I could ask Percy. Percy! My lord! Can you think of another best man? <laughs> the show also benefited majorly from the come-and-go editions of Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. It's like that story, uh, The Prince and the Paupers. And the pauper. <laughs> prince and the pauper's and the pauper. Yeah. Massive change, it seems, is a very good thing. You recognize me. I'm the one that says, ready, aim, fire. <laughs> Can I ask you to leave a pause between the word aim and the word fire? 30 or 40 years, perhaps. <laughs> Number two, Faulty Towers. I hate to trespass further on your valuable time, but might I look at the wine list? Now? Yes, please. Excuse me. <laughs> Here we are. Created as a showpiece for John Cleese and his wife at the time, Connie Booth, this classic almost didn't happen, as few at the BBC found it funny. <laughs> Oh boy. Playing a bombastic and rude hotel manager who sees something to hate in everyone, Cleese stood head and shoulders above his comedy peers. Literally. Throw it away! <laughs> now! <laughs> Throw it away! Cleese later said each episode took six weeks to write, which perhaps explains why he bowed out after just two series. We just stopped talking about the war. Me? You started it? We did not start it. Yes, you did. You invaded Poland. <laughs> Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. Hi, everybody. Hello, Mike, my little Thunderbird puppet. Thunderbirds are go, yeah? Come on, let's fist again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Daddy ill? How ill? Is it of a severity necessary to cancel my candlelight supper? <laughs> What I'm saying is, they're, like, they had to sell proper jobs, you know, for the gantel, then they wouldn't do it. You know, a lot of them's from broken homes. Oh, sorry, Mark, that was just a noise. <laughs> You're the one seeing someone else. You know, I've got to get on with my own life, and I'm sorry if that upsets you. It's just the way it is. You can't dangle the bogus carrot of possible reconciliation in front of my face whilst riding some other donkey, you know. You're a posh spaz. Oh, really? Well, I'd love to know in what way I am a posh spaz. In the way that you're always doing posh spazzy things, like tidying up and ironing your socks. I do not iron my socks. Socks, shirt, whatever. Fish and chips. <laughs> Do it again. Fish and chips. Do it again. I'll forget it. Must be some sort of dish that we don't get over here. Okay. Don't go down there. There are snipers down there. Don't go down there. There are snipers down there. What you doing? The accent. I was going to... Don't. I was doing the accent. We don't mind you having girls up here, but you've got to leave the door open. Yeah, so that we don't miss any of the good stuff. Jesus. Number one, Monty Python's Flying Circus. And now for something completely different. A man with a tape recorder up his nose. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
Taking our top spot and proving you should always expect the Spanish Inquisition is the sketch show that changed it all. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. Our chief weapon is surprise. Surprise and fear. Fear and surprise are two weapons, our fear and surprise. The Python sketch troupe featured a highly educated cast of veteran comedy writers and performers. Is your wife uh, a goer, hey? No, I mean, no, I mean, that's nuts, that's nuts. And whether they were avoiding standard sketch trappings like punchlines and endings, or pushing them to the absurdest limits, the Pythons broke every rule they knew. And they knew a lot of rules. Hello, Polly! <laughs> Polly! Polly Perot, wake up! Polly! Do you agree with our list? What? <laughs> What's your favorite British comedy? Woodstock! <laughs> For more brilliant top tens published daily, be sure to subscribe to watchmojo.com. Yes, nudge, nudge, snap, snap, grin, grin, wink, wink, say no more. <laughs>